Hello, my name's Andy Ridley. Uh, I'm out here on the Great Barrier Reef. We're part of the first of these 24 hour presentation climate reality a thons. Um, so we thought that we would try and take you out onto the Great Barrier Reef. And then we thought, well, how can we get you under the, under the surface and go and actually see some reef and see what it actually looks like. So we've picked a reef, it's called Moor Reef. Um, it's got, it really shows the nuance of what's happening out here. So you've got amazing bits You've got bits where it's recovering and you've got bits that haven't recovered. So we're going to try and show you that. And um, uh, we're also going to introduce you to some of the top scientists working on this incredible place to buy us some time. Some of the projects about reef resilience. Um, so uh, we're going to show you that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what we need, what actions are required in order to protect, conserve this amazing place. So we hope you enjoy it and um, good luck to everyone else. So we thought we'd show you somewhere amazing on the Great Barrier Reef. And that story you've heard, if it all been gone, you can clearly see it isn't. And in fact, this reef was pretty much smashed eight years ago by Cyclone Yassi and also underwent serious bleaching in 2017. But this reef has recovered. And that's the story of reefs, is that they're given a chance, nature is incredible, and they can come back to life just like this has. Now in a couple of weeks, the Great Barrier Reef goes through the famous spawning. And as you can see, this reef looks really good. So, I'm pretty optimistic about this one. And that's the story of the Great Barrier Reef. It's nuanced. It's very different in certain places. Some bits are amazing and some bits are really bad. But it's not black and white. What you see here is a reef but it's been pretty hammered. So it's mostly rubble. And that happens from the accumulated issues of storms and bleaching. Now many of these things are quite natural. But what's happening with climate change is they're becoming more frequent. And the reef never gets time to recover. And that's a great risk for our reefs around the world. Oh, now this is amazing. This is, these are new recruits about the size of my hand. They're about two years old and have come since this whole part of the reef was hammered by the bleaching in 2017. What it shows you is that nature can come back if it's given a chance. And of course the great challenge for these creatures is as long as there isn't another bleaching or a major storm that comes through here, these guys will flourish. And that's the great risk of climate frequency of those challenges. But what it also shows you is how amazing nature is and how a reef will go through multiple cycles in its, in its life story. And that's the story of reefs and the story of the Great Barrier Reef. It's nuanced. Climate change is by far the biggest threat to this place. And as much as we do on the reef, it will be the global response that lets us keep amazing places like this alive and flourishing. We all know the Great Barrier Reef has been affected by climate change, but there are some amazing scientists working right here on the reef to provide solutions to essentially buy some time and keep our Great Barrier Reef healthy. Not only should that work here, but they are providing solutions for people to use all over the world and keep our reefs healthy everywhere. Now, one of those scientists I have with me is Katie Chartrand from James Cook University, here to explain just what they're doing out on the reef during coral spawning. Oh, Katie, you're already here. You snuck off with me like a bull shark. <laughs> it's amazing how I appear like that. <laughs> spawning. Now, how excited are you for spawning tonight? 
I, it's been the buildup of the year for us. We've been planning since last year's spawning event um, to be out here again. And what we're here to do is really harness the millions of egg and sperm bundles that are gonna be released from the corals tonight. Um, they're going to be floating up to the surface in what's like an underwater snowstorm in which all of these egg and sperm bundles are going to be mixing and combining to make that new generation of corals that's going to settle out on the reef. And we're gonna harness those egg and sperm bundles um, to, to grow in a floating nursery here, the coral babies, which will make uh, the future of the Great Barrier Reef. This is our reef, it's everyone's reef, and we all need to protect it. So that's amazing that we can all have the opportunity in the future to really help protect it and save it for everyone. That's right, and I think what's important is that we're, we're buying time for the reef here. It's not um, going to fix every little patch of reef. The Great Barrier Reef is 2,000 reefs and, and incredibly long and we cannot fix the entire thing with one single approach but having something that can get to large impacts and repair areas that are important for downstream delivery of new baby corals into the future gives serious impact at scale. Yeah this isn't going to solve climate change is it? That's right no as we said before it's buying time we have got to act now on climate change and this is really to help those systems that we know are going to be impacted irrespective of what we do today. Those actions, even if taken today, we will have decline in coral here on the Great Barrier Reef and around the world. We already have. So we're really trying to create the tools and the science to make sure we have that available to us in the future when the time comes. Unreal. Thank you so much for your time. And let's hope we're out there later on covered in coral babies. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, I guess, you know, when we think of the Great Barrier Reef, we, we, we have to sort of perhaps think, put into context that it is a very large system. Uh, it covers a huge area, uh, but also it covers a quite a, a range of latitudes. So in, in many respects, it it's, it's, has a number of thermal regimes in, in its own right. So, it, you know, across 10 degrees of latitude from the tropics right down to the subtropics, it, you know, it covers a, a massive area. We know that uh, coral reefs, uh, the coral reef biologists tell us that, that coral reefs are very sensitive to temperature changes um, and it's just the nature of the beast, it's just the way they are. And we also know that when reefs get exposed to what are called marine heat waves, so the, these are the equivalent of a heat wave uh, in the ocean, just like we get a heat wave on the land, um, which can cause animals to, to die of course. Uh, like the flying foxes in Cairns last summer, that was caused by a, a terrestrial heat wave. We also know marine heat waves occur on the reef, and they really uh, they cause the coral to bleach. Okay, and they, they're associated with these mass bleaching events. Uh, we also know that uh, coral reefs. Um, that when we're thinking about climate change, we also need to think about it in terms of climate variability. So we know El Niños are often associated with these bleaching events. They, they seem to be more common during El Nino years. And this is because El Nino years, we've got less cloud cover, less rain and the reef, and less wind as well. So the reef really sits there and the hot water sits on top of the reef and literally cooks it. But the word is it cooks the reef. We also know that um, the planet, planet is warming. We've had one degree of warming since 1910. That's the global average. So the reef is no different. The, the, it's not just the atmosphere that's been warming, but the oceans are warming at a similar rate. So they've had about one degree of warming in that same period of time. Um, and that means that corals are now, they're now being moved, being pushed a little bit outside their comfort zone. And what we're finding is that these bleaching events are now becoming more common. And we could, we, we could be fairly certain going forward that they are going to become more common in the future especially if we uh, don't do something about global emissions. So climate change is a big deal for the reef. It's probably the biggest deal um, because it's one of those things that we know can, can bleach significant areas of the reef and it can affect even areas that are further away from land use, land use uh, influences. Like here, here we are on the outer reef where there's no real effect from the land. There's no sediments or nutrients getting out here but we've got these pristine reefs that are, can still get bleached because it's climate change that's the driver. 
Okay, well, Andy has shown you what the reef is looking like out here on Moore Reef. So you've seen the good, the bad, and the, the ugly. So we can really see the nuance uh, of climate change on the reef. So certainly the reef is not dead, and that's a real take home message. Um, but it is under threat, and you know, climate change is the biggest threat to the reef, and you know, we are seeing the impacts right now. Um, but it's not too late to turn things around, we still can. Um, we know that uh, coral reefs start getting into some serious trouble when we hit about 1.5 degrees um, and currently it looks like if we meet our Paris commitments we'll get to maybe a bit under 2 degrees, maybe a little more, so we really need to be doing more to, to reach net zero emissions by 2050 um, and even sooner if possible. So the role of the individual is really important for to achieve net zero emissions. We won't just do it by transitioning from fossil fuels, although that's obviously a huge piece, um, but individual action, changing the way we do things, moving to a more circular economy is all going to be critical to achieve that goal. Uh, so what can you do as an individual? You're probably asking from all around the world, what can I do to help the Great Barrier Reef out here behind me? Uh, there's plenty you can do. So, you know, even little things like single-use plastics, you know, bringing your own shopping bag, they seem really tiny, but it, it starts to change people's mindsets and they start thinking about something else. We call it a gateway drug into thinking about bigger issues. Um, choosing where you buy your products, your clothes, your services from, is really important so every time you spend money you're you're voting with your wallet so you pick something up think about where has it come from what who has made it what conditions has this company done um, environmentally and if you're choosing those uh, incredible products you're sending a really strong message that that's uh, what you want so we're seeing a lot of consumer driven movement with businesses and communities and you know even cities uh, this demand to be more sustainable to meet the targets that maybe national governments won't meet and I think the more we can build that that voice and that that people power we're gonna start seeing some real change Achieving net zero is a really great goal. It's something that you can, as an individual, aim to achieve. A business can aim to achieve, as we've recently seen with, with Qantas in Australia, have committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050, um, right up to, to governments. Um, it's just where we'll see the, the real change. But sometimes it's so hard to, to have a tangible um, action that you can do as a person. But I think trying to achieve net zero in your life, you know, go plant some trees, waste less, Less, put solar on your roof um, and that's when we'll start seeing some real change. And you can see how amazing this place really is and how alive it looks. Totally inspiring. And we want the Great Barrier Reef not just to be a poster child for climate change but be the inspiration for change because there will be a global response that keeps a place like this looking as amazing as it does.